Good evening and welcome to tonight's Policy Beats in a Pint. My name is Robert Erbel and I'm the Director of Operations for the Manitoba Institute for Policy Research. To find out more about the Institute and what we do, I invite you to take a look at the handles you found in your chair tonight or visit our website at mipr.ca. Tonight we'll be discussing war in the 21st century and its implications for Canada. November 11th marked the day to remember the men and women who have served the military in Canada. 2014 is also the 100th anniversary of the start of World War I and the 75th anniversary of our entry into World War II. As Canadian soldiers embark on new combat missions, it is important that we evaluate the lessons that Canada has learned for the past century of a war and how it has changed our society and what it might be in the future for war and the implications for our country. These are some of the issues that our panel will be um, addressing tonight. Our panelists this evening are Dr. Andrea Chiron, Deputy Director for the Center of Defense and Security Studies at the University of Manitoba, and Dr. Jim Ferguson, the Director for the Center of Defense and Security Studies. Their detailed biographies are on your welcome, uh, with your welcome papers. Dan Lapp was supposed to join us this evening, unfortunately he was unable to make it. Uh, following this event, I ask you to fill the feedback forms that are there. A lot of our ideas and a lot of what we do comes from your feedback. So I'll now pass the mic to Andrea to start us off uh, Thank you very much for coming. I uh, was supposed to be moderating, but uh, now I'm a panelist, so um, I've had only a few minutes to sort of put some thoughts together. What I wanted to reflect on on Canada, the implications for Canada in terms of war, is that this year in many ways is a number of anniversaries. Uh, Rob mentioned a few of them. But we've also had some sort of startling statistics. On the one hand, I think support of the Canadian forces has never been higher. On the other hand, our Canadian forces members are not supposed to wear uniforms outside of a base or theater of operation or in pretty places. So there's a conundrum there. Our Canada First Defense Strategy, which has been in place now for a number of years, is due for a tweak. And the thinking is that it's going to be more of an evolution than it will be a revolution. There are still things to consider in terms of our Canada First Defense Strategy. One of the things that has been said is that there are so many priorities that are assumed in it that it really isn't a very helpful document anymore. And certainly didn't anticipate the number of activities that our forces would be doing today. We have forces in Kuwait and Lithuania. We also have troops supporting UN missions. The tempo which we thought would maybe be on the decline seems to be ramping up and this too has implications. At the same time we have the United States which is still arguably the hegemon in the world but there are potential challengers specifically China and potentially Russia that we're watching. The other thing we're reminded of is that with groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda, non-state actors have never been as well financed, as well organized, and as battle-hardened as these seem to be. All of this means that for Canada, we have to make choices. On the one hand, we're fairly insulated because we are located right beside the United States and it's up to them to act first and then we have the luxury of deciding what else we provide. On the other hand, with the US so bogged down in so many missions, with the threat of sequestration in the future, uh, they may be looking to allies to provide more support, more troops, um, and certainly more security here in Canada. So those are my initial thoughts. I'll turn it over to Jim, and then I think the thinking is we'd love to hear from, from you and get a debate and the discussion going. So thank you. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Rob. <clears throat> Let me begin by saying this is an anomaly. Canadians normally don't talk about defense. Canadians normally don't talk about the role of Canada's armed forces particularly overseas. Uh, there has been a reawakening, if I can put it that way, over the past several years of Canadians paying more attention to defense, largely as a function of the war in Afghanistan. Uh, for the first time since the Korean War, roughly 50 years, Canadian forces have been in combat. 
And that is a function of the nature of that war in Afghanistan. And remember, the government of Canada didn't really ever want to talk about it as a war. There's other phrases that were used. Uh, but as a function of that war, we have a, in a way, a different environment, a, awakening again. We've seen it, at least I've seen it anecdotally uh, over the last 10 years or so in the attendance at Remembrance Day ceremonies. More and more of the public have been attended, attending. If I go back 20 years, a lot of the services I've gone to have been sparsely attended, mostly dominated by vets and their families, rather than broader Canadian society. And I think it's an interesting change, but I don't know to the extent to which it's a lasting change, or whether it's just a function of the unique events of the past 10 years, uh, and particularly partially the events in Ottawa recently, uh, and that we will go back to the way we used to be. And that is largely not paying a great deal of defense, attention to defense, and not paying a great deal of attention to the Canadian forces and the role they play in terms of Canadian interests and values overseas. Um, if you think in terms of broader Canadian culture, uh, novels, movies, TV, we don't celebrate the Canadian forces and the roles they've played and their importance or value to Canadian society. And I don't mean to celebrate in the terms of a positive or negative sense. It's simply an awareness that we talk about. I'll, I'll, I'll pay your, take you back to two years ago, which was the anniversary of the War of 1812. If you look at what the Canadian government did and what Canadian society and culture did with regards to that war, which is a very important war, war because if the British or the Canadians and the British hadn't won the war, we wouldn't be Canadians, we'd be Americans right now. But the celebrations or the investment or the, the media reports of it, and I remember watching uh, just recently on the Smithsonian Channel the Canadian Heritage funding of a sort of a pseudo cartoonish documentary with some reenactment. It was truly pathetic. Uh, and I looked south of the border, of course, and you wouldn't see this south of the border. Uh, and it tells us a lot about Canadian attitudes towards. And it's not a question in my mind about support for the forces. I think there's been a large, quiet, strong support for the forces and the soldiers and sailors and airmen uh, and the things they've done. But in terms of thinking about the role that armed forces play or defensive plays, what do you want to call it? Uh, in the evolution of Canada, Canadians don't pay attention to it. They don't teach it. Uh, my experience coming out of students I've talked to coming out of high school, talking to my own kids as they went through high school. We don't talk about these events anymore. They're not taught in school. And that tells us a great deal about questions about how the Canadian public and what we might have learned or have not learned from uh, Canada, Canada's involvement overseas. And I think it's an important consideration when we think about the future and the potential for what has been in the past decade. And you think back, for example, to the deployment of Canadian forces in uh, Yugoslavia, first with number four, the United Nations Protection Force one and two, and then with the NATO forces. Uh, there's really not much of an attention paid to it. Uh, that was really our first combat mission. Uh, since the uh, since Korea was in Yugoslavia, but most of you, I would suspect, don't know that. Uh, and why is that the case? Well, I think partially the reason it's the case is we've developed a sense, two senses of a myth in Canada. One is a myth that Canada evolved and emerged from a set of peaceful, political, social, and economic compromises, distinct from how the Americans emerged which was the manifest destiny and the expansion to the West, the use of force to quell the native communities, bring them to oppress them, to steal their land, however you want to put it. We don't have that story here. We have a different myth we've developed. And the second part of it is that when we think about our deployment of forces from World War I, World War II, to Korea, to peacekeeping operations, uh, to the post-Cold War, to Yugoslavia, up to the Afghanistan War, there's a sense that we never deploy our forces. We don't use force for self-interest purposes. We always use, are using force to help others. Uh, to go, go back to Senator Raul Dandaran back in the 20s when he said that Canada was a fireproof house, far from flammable materials, 
that still echoes today, I think, in Canadian society. We're in Syria and Iraq today, not because it's in our interest to be there, not that we're going to gain anything. We're not a hegemon or a great power. We're, doing, we're there to help Iraqis and, civilian, and Syrians. We're in Afghanistan to Af help the Afghan people, not as a response to the potential threat that terrorists, the Taliban, Al Qaeda play really in Afghanistan, or ISIS might potentially play in the future relative to North America and Canada. I don't think we really conceive of that that way. We are there to go and help people. Uh, and it's the same with the peacekeeping myth. The peacekeeping myth in Canada is not, the problem with that myth is everyone tends to think that what we mean by this is Canadian forces only do peacekeeping rather than we're not warriors like the Americans. That's not really what my view of the peacekeeping myth is. What it really is, is Canada goes and helps other people just for the greater good. It reflects the nature of our own story we tell ourselves about the history of Canada. Uh, we don't talk about the interests we have, why politically we're there. And of course, it goes beyond just trying to help people. And I'm not trying to degrade or, or criticize that sense. But nonetheless, it's something that, which pushes us forward and then looks at the implications for where we go in the future. And I think that, and I'll just conclude with, with two observations here. First, the future is not ours to decide. The future is everyone else's. Uh, we will respond to agendas set by the great powers, by the dominant actors, by crises and conflicts which emerge on the world stage. And we'll respond for a lot of reasons. One of them, the impulse to do good, to help others, which is important. Others with regards to perceptions and thinking we have with regards to relations to Europe and our allies, with regards, of course, to our vital relationship with the United States, where our interests really lie. And of course, it's also about advancing interests about a world where we benefit from, a world of liberal democracies, uh, rather than a world like the one we live in right now. Where that will go will depend a great deal on issues and events out of our control. Uh, what it means with a rise in China, if we end up in a conflict or in an adversarial relationship similar to the Soviet Union and the United States in the West during the Cold War, whether we'll move westward to the Pacific, which is something we've never really paid attention to, is one possibility. We may continue as crises emerge in the Middle East or in Africa or in Southeast Asia to send troops there uh, to support a variety of interests and our own values about what, the way we think governments should be organized, proper good governance. So I don't think we're going to see a lot of change, and I wonder if we've ever learned many lessons over all the last century or so when we began to become more independent. Uh, we're dependent, we're a reactive state, and as long as society sees the use of the forces in terms of that greater good beyond ourselves to help others, then I think the governments of Canada, regardless of the political strife in the future, will be willing to deploy Canadian forces, and they will have the support of Canadian society, as in fact we've always had, or governments have always had in Canada. So I'll leave it there, and I think there's lots of issues we can talk about.